As I uh, step into this um, next six uh, Sundays, um, I will be sharing with you a sermon series called Then and Now, in which I'll take a look back over 76 sermon series over 25 years. And we've had members of our church, pastors of our church, including Dan and Joanna, who participated in these series in the past. And I'm grateful for all of that and more. As I looked over um, the years and years, I was trying to find some of the best of, or at least close to. <laughs> so I've pulled these six across many, many years, and I hope you'll find them helpful in some way. Today is actually a little different in that this has more to do with now than it has anything to do with then. Although I have spoken and preached and written about faith and politics, this is a different animal today. And so I hope that as we step into the question, Christian nationalism, neither Christian nor patriotic, uh, you'll bear with me. But for a moment, I want you to focus on one sentence from the scripture lesson we just heard and from all of the scripture lessons from the day. John 6, 14, following Jesus' miracle of feeding 5,000, we just heard when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Indeed, Jesus is the prophet. He is the prophetic miracle worker, savior of the world that has come into the world and continues to come into the world to save the world. And as I like to say, it's John who tells us over and over again, he comes to save the world, not the church. So let's not just get all cushy in the church. He's here for everyone, everywhere, and for us. We live in a time when words like prophet and martyr and saint are used freely and inappropriately by all kinds of people. And as we step into this series, then and now, we all need to remember that our truest miracle-working prophet who has come into the world and continues to bestow his spirit upon the world is Jesus Christ. He stands out as the one who has pointed billions of people to the fullness of love and justice through two millennium and continues to do so up to this very present moment. All other prophets and miracle workers before and since pale in comparison. In Jesus, we have all of our reasons for faith and hope and love and what we need for daily living. And in response to his presence in our lives, we need to keep him at the heart and at the soul of our lived faith experience. So let's now take a look at Christian nationalism. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. On January 6th, which was the day of epiphany for the Christian church in 2021, crowds gathered in front of the United States Capitol to protest the results of the 2020 election. What started as a peaceful protest led by President Trump and others became a riot as the day unfolded. In the hours that followed, one of the most disturbing things that we witnessed on display was Christian imagery that was everywhere, mixed among the signs of other things, the Confederate flag and QAnon memorabilia and Viking helmets were signs and crosses, the signs that said Jesus saves in Jesus 2020. As protesters crowded onto the Capitol steps and then into the building itself, a shofar blew from a woman across the street singing out, in her words, peace in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus covering this place. And those words were to become prophetic in the minutes and hours ahead. In the aftermath of the Capitol attack, many saw a clear connection between violence, that violence, and Christian nationalism. As Tish Harrison Warren wrote on January 7, 2021, in Christian Century, or excuse me, Christianity Today, a conservative Christian publication founded by Billy Graham in 1956. She wrote, the responsibility of yesterday's violence must be in part laid at the feet of those evangelical leaders who ushered in and applauded Trump's presidency. It can also be sadly laid at the feet of white 
Christians everywhere more broadly. Christian nationalism has shown itself in many ways throughout our 248 years in history. So what is Christian nationalism and how is it different from Christianity? How is it different from patriotism? How should Christians think about nations, especially for us, about our nation, the United States? And is nationalism bad? Does it mean that we should reject nationality and national loyalty altogether? And the last question's answer is no, absolutely not. And I expect that everybody will be cheering USA for the next two weeks as we continue to uh, compete in the Paris Olympics. So let me break this down, first of all. Patriotism is good. Patriotism is good. Patriotism is the love of country. But patriotism from nationalism is different from nationalism in this way. It is an argument of, nationalism becomes an argument about how to define our country. As Christians, we should recognize that patriotism is good because all of God's creation is good. And patriotism helps us appreciate and participate and celebrate our place in this part of God's creation called the United States of America. Our affection and loyalty to our specific part of God's creation helps us to do good work, cultivating and improving the part that we've been given by God. As Christians, we can and should love the United States of America, which also means working to improve this country by holding it up for critique when necessary and working daily for justice and peace when it airs. But nationalism is different than patriotism. There are many definitions of nationalism and an active debate about how best to define it. Paul D. Miller, professor of practical international affairs at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service writes in the same Christianity Today, I reviewed the standard academic literature on nationalism and found several reoccurring themes. I'll try to read this slowly because it's packed. So listen carefully. Most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually distinct, internally coherent cultural groups defined by shared traits like language, religion, ethnicity, or culture. From there, scholars say, nationalists believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that the governments should promote and protect a nation's cultural identity, and that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for human beings. And this is where things begin to break down. Christian nationalism then is the belief that our American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain always a Christian nation, not merely as an observation about our foundation or about American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be into the future. Scholars like Samuel Huntington have made a similar argument that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past and that we will lose our identity and our freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance. Christian nationalists do not reject the First Amendment and do not advocate for theocracy most of the time, but they do believe that Christianity should enjoy a privileged place and position in the public square. The term Christian nationalism is relatively new and it advocates generally um, in a way that its own people do not use that term, but it's accurate in describing American nationalists who believe American identity is inextricably linked to Christianity. So what is the problem with nationalism? Simply this, humanity is never easily divisible into mutually distinctive cultural units. Think about this. Humanity does not easily divide into mutually distinct cultural units. If you think about that, it's so true 
It'll blow you away, right? Cultures, cultures overlap and their borders are fuzzy. I want you to pause and take a look around our room and you'll see that that's true for us. It's true for all people, really. Since cultural units are fuzzy, they make a poor fit as a foundation for political order. Cultural identities are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around, but political boundaries are much harder and semi-permanent. Attempting to found Attempting to uh, found a political, legitimate, cultural likeness means that political order will constantly be in danger of being felt as illegitimate by, illegitimate by some group or another. So cultural pluralism is essentially inevitable in every single nation. It doesn't matter where we are on earth, cultural pluralism has its place because it defines us no matter where we are. Some say that this is no real problem at all. So they say, let people express themselves and their views. But in reality, it's a very serious problem. When nationalists go about constructing their nation, they have to define who is in that nation and who is out of that nation. Clearly, anyone who does not claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right away cannot be in that nation. Think about that. So anyone that you know that doesn't declare can't be in this nation if we're a Christian nationalist nation. Let's take it even further. In reality, there are always dissidents and minorities and various religious expressions and experiences in every nation on earth. There are always those who do not or cannot conform to the nationalist preferred cultural template. In the absence of moral authority, nationalists can only establish themselves by force. Everyone who studies this agrees that nationalist governments tend to become authoritarian and oppressive in their practice. For example, in past generations, to the extent that the United States has a quasi-established official religion of Protestantism, it did not respect the true religious freedom of others. Just ask any Catholic, any Muslim, any Jew about their history and their experience in America, and then you can go further into cult, beyond religious identities into various ethnic groups and national groups, and they will verify the historic abuse. Worse, the United States and many individuals state that Christianity is used inappropriately in this way as a prop to support slavery, and segregation and now in our day and age to attack basic LGBTQIA rights and non-Christian people, especially new Americans. Christian nationalists want to define America as a Christian nation and they want the government to promote a specific cultural template to, as an official culture of the country. It can't be done if we're honest, but they're trying to do it. So let's be clear, many of their purported beliefs would exclude you as a baptized Christian because you do not meet their definition in some way or another of what a true Christian is. So you're already out of this culture and nation. Some have advocated for an amendment to the Constitution to recognize America's Christian heritage. Others want to reinstate prayer in public schools, but only certain kinds of prayer and only their prayers, right? Some work to enshrine a Christian nationalist interpretation of American history and school curricula, including that America has a special relationship with God and has been chosen by God to carry out, <clears throat> to carry out a very special mission on earth. Others advocate for immigration restrictions, specifically to prevent a change to relig American religious and ethnic demographics, which might change the American culture in quotation marks. Some want to empower the government to take stronger action to circumscribe what is immoral behavior. And some, again, like the scholar Samuel Huntington again, have argued that the United States government must defend and enshrine its predominant Anglo-Protestant culture to ensure the survival of American democracy. Sometimes Christian nationalism is so evident with its political agenda, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. 
It's an unstated presumption, though, that Christians are entitled to a very special place in the public square because they are heirs of the true and essential heritage of American culture. That Christians have a presumptive right to define the meaning of American experience, and they themselves are the architects, first citizens, and guardians of that experience. If you don't believe me, you should look up some of the videos on this stuff. It's scary. Christian nationalism tends to treat other Americans as second-class citizens, including, but not excluding, others, including women and children and immigrants. They also tend to treat science and scientists and scientific education with disdain, and if fully implemented, it would not be something where you would find the respect for religious liberty of all Americans. Empowering the state through moral legislation to regulate conduct always carries the risk of overreaching, setting a bad precedent, and quite frankly, creating governmental powers that backfire against the people who were created in the first place. So it's just stupid. In case you don't know this, legislating morality never works. Just read your Bible and you'll see how it fails time and time again. Additionally, Christian nationalism is, is an ideology held overwhelmingly by white Christian Americans, and thus it tends to exacerbate racial and ethnic cleavages. In recent years, the movement has grown increasingly white, characterized by fear and by a belief that, the Christian, that Christians are all victims of persecution in America. And some are beginning to argue that American Christians need to prepare to fight physically to preserve Americans' identity in an argument that they played out on January 6, 2021. Christian nationalists often project an image of Jesus with an AK-47 wielding this uh, AK-47 as a weaponized strongman. If you don't believe me again, look it up. Not only that, they mock and decry anyone who sees Jesus in any way other than violent, as nonviolent, any way other than special and Rambo looking, like loving all people, that Jesus is bad in their mind. That's frightening when you put this all together. I believe all of this makes Christian nationalism dangerous to church and society. And it takes the name of Christ for a worldly political agenda, proclaiming that its program is the political program for every true believer. This is wrong in principle, no matter what your agenda is, because only the church is authorized to proclaim the name of Jesus and to carry his cross and his standard into the world. It is even worse with a political movement that champions some causes that are unjust, which is the case with Christian nationalism and its um, description of what they consider democratic or non-democratic policies, and I mean small d. Christian nationalism calls evil good and good evil, in my mind. It takes the name of Jesus Christ as a fig leaf to cover over its political program, treating the message of Jesus as a tool and a weapon of political propaganda, and the church becomes a handmaiden and a cheerleader of the state. In reality, our Christian faith is focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ as defined by the Bible guided by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit, and strengthened by our creeds and our covenants and our traditions. It is the gathering of people from every tribe and nation, according to scripture, every language and people who worship Jesus, a faith that unites all people, Jews and Greeks, slave and free, from every nation of the world. Again, Americans and non-Americans together. Christianity is political only in the sense that its adherents have always understood their faith must challenge and affect and transcend the things of the world that cause pain to the poorest of the poor and those who are hurting. That's not a single political worldview, that's a simple way of saying we have to follow God, that we have to love our neighbor and we have to seek justice for all. In contrast, Christian nationalism is a political ideology focused ideology focused on the national destiny of the United States. It includes a specific understanding of American history and American government that are obviously not biblical, an understanding that is contested by most historians, political scientists, and theologians 
Most importantly, Christian nationalism includes specific policy prescriptions that it claims are biblical but are not. At their best, there are biblical principles that have been torn and tattered and left on the floor. They're contrary to the Bible most of the time. American Christians in the past have been exemplary in helping establish our American experiment. And many American Christians, including you, have worked to end the things that are wrong about this world, worked to end slavery and segregation and other evils. They did so because they believed Christianity required them to work for justice. But they worked to advance Christian principles, not Christian power or Christian culture as they defined it, which is a key distinction between what the political agenda is of Christian nationalism and what we do. Normal Christians engage politics in humble, loving, and sacrificial ways. It rejects the idea that Christians are entitled to primacy of place in the public square, but that we share that with our sisters and brothers or that Christians have a presumptive right to continue their historical predominance in American culture today. Today, Christians should seek to love their neighbors by pursuing justice in the public square, including promoting religious liberty or fostering racial justice or protecting the rule of law or looking after the homeless and figuring out how we don't become like California and simply set up legislation against people who don't have a place to live and honoring constitutional processes. That agenda is very different from promoting a Christian culture, a Western heritage, and an Anglo-Protestant value that you call the truth. There is no question in my mind that we as Christians can and should be politically engaged, but I also believe that we can and should do this without becoming Christian nationalists, because Christian nationalism is neither Christian nor patriotic. Following the Lord of life, may each of you find a way to express your faith in action in healthy, productive, and patriotic ways.